Hi everyone, I'm Hanobi Skinover, the Training and Resource Coordinator for Redmond Consulting, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Before we begin, for those who may not know, Redmond is a nonprofit organization that provides tribal technical assistance on a variety of programs, including but not limited to housing and homeless services, children and youth, and elder abuse. This ranges from policy review via email to site visits. If you are interested, you can contact me at, at hanovi at red-wind.net. That's H-O-N-O-V-I at red-wind.net. As this states, this project is supported by grant number 2015-TAAX-K069 awarded by the Office of Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. This webinar is a part of our Housing and Homeless Services Project. Presenting with us today is Katie Simmons, Katie is the CFO of Bo Simone Consulting and brings a diverse past to this project. Having worked in K through 12 and higher education, the nonprofit and for-profit sectors, and with local and state governments for close to 20 years. She has a deep appreciation for community engagement and inclusiveness when approaching work in affordable housing and homelessness. She served for two years as the program manager for Denver's Road Home, the city's homeless plan, where she oversaw emergency shelter and street outreach efforts, coordinated nine Project Homeless Connect events, and managed community engagement with various neighborhoods. Katie then consulted with Governor Hickenlooper's Office of Community Partnerships, leading a statewide effort to help communities access the needs of their most vulnerable and at-risk populations across the state of Colorado. If you have any questions, you can put them into the chat box or click the hand icon and we'll be able to see that. And I'll now turn it over to Katie. Thank you so much, Anobi, I appreciate it. And I just would like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward to spending the next 60 to 90 minutes with you having a discussion. Um, Hanover, are you going to be able to forward the slides for me? Wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so I am with Bo Simone Consulting. As Anobi said, my name is Katie Simons. Um, my colleague Zoe LeBeau um, could not join us today. She apologizes, was hoping to be here, but is dealing with um, a personal matter. But uh, Bo Simone, between the two of us and the number of subcontractors that we work with, um, we are a women-owned consulting company based out of Denver, Colorado, but we work all over the country. Um, we work um, with tribal communities all over, as well as urban and rural communities. Um, and between Zoe and myself, we probably have about 40 years of experience, um, you know, anything from direct homeless services to affordable housing development. Um, we are technical assistance providers under HUD and under contract with um, the National American Indian Housing Council and are very grateful to Redwood Consulting for inviting us to be here today. So thank you so much to the group. Uh, next slide, please. So today we are hopeful that we can um, have you leave with a basic understanding of the housing development process, um, which can really help when advocating for survivors' needs in your community. So what, what, what we do as a consulting group is really focus on affordable and permanent supportive housing. So I'd like to talk a little bit with you today about the supportive housing model and its basic guiding principles. Um, and then we'll kind of just jump a little bit after we do that overview into what it would look like to actually develop um, a housing project, whether it be on a uh, reservation with the tribes, TDHE, or housing authority, um, or in a local community, um, on or off reservation. Um, it might be in an urban or rural community setting. Um, but this really is a model that can help folks who are um, experiencing a high need, whether that is because of domestic and sexual violence, 
um, or other things that might be contributing to one's housing instability. Um, so we'd love to talk a little bit about just um, how you go about developing a basic project concept and timeline for thinking about developing this type of housing um, and really thinking of it through a holistic housing lens. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the development process and who's part of that team. And then I do want to um, talk a little bit about funding sources, including the new American Rescue Plan Act um, and how there's a number of um, opportunities, both for um, uh, tribes and TDHEs in a way that we really haven't seen before, which we find to be very, very exciting. Um, and I'll also give you a case study of a project up in Montana with the Confederate Tribes of Salish and Kootenai that was done last year, um, really focusing on some of these new dollars to be able to um, acquire and rehab a an old motel to be able to turn into 14 units of supportive housing. So um, that's kind of our basic agenda today. Um, I'd love for folks, if they're willing to, to chat into the box, um, where you're from, um, you know, who, who or which organization you are with, and if there's anything specifically that you are really hoping to get from the webinar today, I'd love to, um, to hear your questions as well or any points that you want to make sure that we, we touch on. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Okay, so starting with kind of a basic overview of what permanent supportive housing is. Um, this is kind of the long-winded definition, but uh, what, it, what it is is a cost-effective and outcome-driven and more humane solution to ending homelessness. Um, this is a model for both individuals and families, oftentimes who struggle with addiction, mental health, or other disabilities um, who can benefit from and thrive in subsidized housing or supportive services. Um, here on the right is a picture of some of the kids who uh, live at Gamaji which is a supportive housing community in Duluth, Minnesota with the American Indian Community Housing Organization or ACO. Um, it's just a really incredible culturally um, relevant housing project that is inside of an old YWCA that was, that was rehabbed and turned into um, a community and cultural center um, that has an art uh, gallery and art room. It has an indigenous first gift shop um, where a lot of local artists sell their beadwork and their art. Um, and there's just so much programming, whether it's in the rooftop garden, teaching kids how to um, garden native foods, or um, be a part of some of the other things that they are doing in their own community. It's just a, a really great example. And so we can certainly dig a little bit more into that as well. But I just love starting out this presentation um, showing, right, that this type of housing um, is not just for people who we think of as maybe being chronically homeless um, or unstably housed, but it really is for families as well. Um, so anyway, thanks so much for everybody who's chiming in. Um, welcome again and appreciate, appreciate you being here. Uh, we can go on to the next slide, please. So again, digging a little bit deeper into what the Permanent Supportive Housing or PSH, as we sometimes tend to call it is, um, the permanent really just means that this is not time limited housing. So it's not a transitional housing model where, you know, somebody has um, you know, a woman or a family, for example, has has two years, 24 months to stay in that unit or stay in that um, that place, um, you know, and, and, and may have some very specific goals that that they would have to meet before moving on. This really is an environment where people, um, you know, have leases, they have usually their own apartments. Um, sometimes we see SROs or single room occupancies in a shared communal environment, but most of the time we see people who have individual apartments with their own bathroom and kitchen. Um, they pay rent, they have, hold a lease, and they can stay for as long as they'd like, really as long as they're, um, you know, abiding by the terms of their lease and really benefiting from the services that are offered. Um, it is affordable, so generally speaking, this is for very low income people who may be earning around 30% or less of the area median income. Um, so in a lot of communities that might be, you know, no more than $17,000 a year that somebody is making. Um, and so we do want folks to contribute to rent when they can um, and ask that residents pay no more than 30% of their income towards rent. If they move in and they have zero income, then they pay zero rent. But one of the goals of supportive housing is to help people increase their income and whether that's by opportunities to work and employment or whether it's through um, benefits, for example, that they are entitled to, such as a veteran who's maybe never received veterans benefits or somebody who is um, seeking social security disability income. And so really trying to get people the income that they need um, and then allowing them to pay no more than 30% of that income towards their rent. 
And then, you know, this type of housing is as independent as possible where residents do hold a lease, again, with kind of the normal rights and responsibilities as you or I would have if we were in a, in a rental apartment. Uh, next slide, please. So again, who is who lives in permanent supportive housing? Um, this type of housing is, again, for families and individuals um, who may be experiencing homelessness, um, including those living on the streets and in shelters. This includes domestic violence shelters um, as well. Um, maybe couch surfing, right? Or living with grandma or auntie, um, but in some overcrowded conditions, right? Maybe not having their own room, but sleeping on a couch, for example. Um, a lot of folks maybe who are coming out of prison or jail or other systems of care um, and are in need of some type of affordable and supportive services. And then again, you know, places that are not meant for human habitation. This could be fishing shacks, this could be garages, cars, um, squatting in abandoned buildings, et cetera. Uh, next slide. And oftentimes we do see people who um, are, are struggling with serious chemical dependency or mental health issues um, and really need supportive services to maintain that housing. Um, sometimes people have been you know, kicked out of traditional you know, tribal affordable housing um, or public housing because um, for one reason or another, um, they've, they've broken many of the rules or they've violated the lease and you know, they've burned their bridges in other housing or service programs. Um, and, and this is not because, you know, these are bad people. These, this is maybe because they've had some, some behaviors, some big behaviors, we like to call them, that um, are associated with uh, substance use disorder, mental health, or other disabilities, and that they really haven't had the support that they need um, to really be able to deal with some of those challenges. So this really, again, is going to take somebody from an environment that maybe um, didn't give them any kind of wraparound service support and puts them into an environment um, where they can have that type of supportive services from staff on site really 24 seven. Um, and then again, a lot of frequently um, utilized emergency services. So when, when we see people who are cycling through the local jails, emergency rooms, um, hospitals, you know, uh, detox centers, et cetera, um, we really are trying to find folks who, you know, we know it costs um, systems a lot of money, roughly about $40,000 a year to keep somebody cycling through those emergency services and those emergency shelters when we can wrap services around that person and give them affordable subsidized housing um, for about $24,000. So you really do see quite a quite a cost savings there. Um, and so, you know, again, this is sort of, it, it, it's, it's uh, not um, always that, you know, the same type of person ends up in supportive housing, but we just wanted to kind of give you an overview of some of the different uh, demographics that we oftentimes, oftentimes see in these types of buildings. Uh, next slide. Great, thank you. And then the benefits of supportive housing. Um, again, this is another picture from Gamaji. I love this picture of um, some musicians up on the stage there in the art gallery um, playing for, for people living in the, in the housing units there as well as in the larger community. Um, you know, we do know that, that giving people their own space, it, oftentimes really to begin their, their journey towards healing. Um, you know, people oftentimes ask me, is this recovery housing? Is this sober housing? Um, you know, we know this is not, it's not a treatment facility. It's not a sober living environment, but we do know that this is a type of recovery housing, whether that recovery is from um, substance use disorder, mental health, or really trauma, um, that this really does allow people to begin their, their journey towards healing. Um, and from whatever trauma, um, institutionalized trauma, generational trauma, um, historical trauma, domestic and sexual violence, um, you know, incarceration, being separated from their families, et cetera. Um, many of the people, if not, I would say 100% of the people who live in supportive housing have experienced some sort of trauma. So, um, you know, we're trying to reduce the stress, um, you know, caused by this type of doubled up or overcrowding and really be able to give people their own place. Um, we know that it reduces the use of these crisis and in institutional services, again, such as the detox or or emergency room. Um, it produces much better outcomes than some of our more expensive systems of care. Um, it significantly reduces recidivism rates of people going back into homelessness, back into uh, jail or prison. And it is a way of ending the cycle of homelessness, right? So, so we really do want to um, you know, try to figure out ways to break those, those cycles of poverty. And this is why, again, family supportive housing where mom and, and, and kids can be together um, can really you know, start to not just wrap those supportive services around mom, some of the things that maybe she's dealing with in a, in a domestic violence situation, but also really wrap those supportive services around the kids 
so that they are getting into early education programs or they are getting into after school programs, that there is somebody there to meet them from the bus or from coming home from school and welcome them into their home. So they're not having to, you know, go from homeless shelter or domestic violence shelter to school and get their only meals at school. That We really are trying to wrap those services around the children as well and end these cycles of homelessness and poverty. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is kind of repetitive of what supportive housing is not, but it, again, it's not a shelter, it's not a group home, not transitional housing or residential care facility. And again, it's, it's you know, it's not a, a treatment center for um, for drugs and alcohol, but we would say it is, it is somewhat a treatment center for trauma, if you will, um, that we really are trying to help, again, um, allow for folks to get connected to the services that will benefit them from, from struggling with, with trauma, with, with substance use disorder and with mental illness. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the guiding principles um, that we use in supportive housing, um, these might be terms familiar to folks. Um, the housing first model uh, is, is really kind of the, um, the, the model that we think about when, um, when meeting people where they are with regards to their needs for housing. Um, we really do believe that there is a solution to, to houselessness or to homelessness, and that is, is housing. We know that housing transforms lives. We do think of harm reduction as sort of the engagement strategy or one of the engagement strategies um, that works really well under a housing first model. So I'll talk a little bit more about these two guiding principles uh, on the next slide, please. So um, many of you might be familiar with this, with this pyramid. This is from Maslow's um, Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow was a, an anthropologist, sociologist, and actually worked with um, the Blackfeet uh, nation to really kind of come up with this, this pyramid, this, this hierarchy of needs, if you will, um, and studied the Blackfeet and really found that these were some of the healthiest people um, that he had ever worked with and ever, ever studied. And the reason that he found that was because they were meeting people's physiological needs right at the bottom of this pyramid. So before ever thinking about how we move up this pyramid to self-actualization, um, you know, Maslow found that when we meet people's basic needs, right, when you give them air and food, water, shelter, clothing and sleep, right, that all provides a foundation, right, from which a person or family can access the services and supports that they need to achieve stability. So we know that recovery, either from, again, mental illness, substance use disorder, trauma, cannot begin, right? We can't start to pursue um, personal goals until we have that very strong foundation of housing. So Housing First offers um, you know, permanent affordable housing as quickly as possible, right? And then once the person is stably housed, then we start to provide supportive services and connections to the community um, to, so that people can really keep their housing and hopefully thrive in their housing, right? So, so once we get someone stably high, housed, you know, then we can start thinking about the safety and security needs. Then we can start thinking about love and belonging, self-esteem, and you know, all the way up to self-actualization. I mean, I say I continue to work towards self-actualization every day, and I'm certainly not not there anymore at all. But, uh, but I would say it's you know, it's something that when we move people in, we automatically think, oh. They're going to just, you know, be able to, um, you know, start participating in cultural events and start, you know, doing, um, you know, medicine practices and start connecting with dance groups and um, drum circles and that type of thing. And, and really what somebody might need is just to come in, sit down, you know, have a safe place to be and maybe, you know, begin to, to slowly, you know, form relationships with the people who live there. That might be their neighbors, that might be the staff. Um, but oftentimes it takes a long time for people to really transition from the streets or from an unsafe environment, um, whether it's an abusive situation or relationship or um, an ins unstable or unstable housing experience and really transition in, into housing. Um, I know there have been some critiques. Um, tribes that I have worked with before have said, you know, this, this is missing certainly the, the spiritual piece. And so um, I know there are some critiques with, with this hierarchy of needs here. Um, and I've even heard from some folks, you know, even having this kind of hierarchy instead of maybe a rounded, you know, more circular type of diagram to, to show some of these needs might be more appropriate. But, um, but it is something that I think, you know, at least with this foundational piece, at least helps us try to get that message across of what, um, of what Housing First really is and what its guiding principles are. All right. Uh, 
Thanks so much uh, for chatting into the box, Robin, and we can go on to the next slide. So again, we just we we believe that housing is a basic human right, um, and and we also know that you know homelessness is a really bad treatment plan, and that we just we can't again we can't treat somebody's addiction when they're living under a bridge or living in their car. Um, we can't really you know again try to make somebody feel safe, right? If they um, continue to be homeless, and so you know what what we know is is um, we don't always treat housing basically as a basic human right um, in, you know, in, in this country at least. Um, and we really do believe that everybody has a right to housing regardless of, of what their challenges might be. So we really are trying to say with Housing First, we wanna meet somebody where they are regardless um, of some of their circumstances currently, give them that housing as a stable foundation and then move on from there with trying to help them on this path to healing. Uh, next slide, please. So again, with the housing first model, you know, we say that people don't need to be housing ready, right? We say that people don't need to be sober necessarily to be living here. Um, we shouldn't be denying people housing because, you know, they didn't meet predetermined clinical goals um, or didn't, you know, choose to participate in, in services, right? So we're not, we're not forcing folks to enter into a treatment program. We're not fo forcing folks to get a job. We're not forcing people into, um, being med medicine compliant. Um, what we're basically saying is, you know, if somebody wants to go down any of those paths, we want to help them get connected to those services. But again, we're gonna make sure that we welcome people in where they are um, and not push our own sort of clinical predetermined plans or service plans or goals um, uh, onto, onto people. We, we wanna make sure we're never using housing, right? To to uh, coerce people into services that they would otherwise not choose. Um, and we know that housing and services are going to be interconnected in this model, but there's definitely separate criteria for the operation and evaluation of each. So again, with the Housing First model, services are voluntary. Um, they're not required, but what we like to say is they're, they're voluntary um, for the client. They're not voluntary for, for the case managers or the staff, right? We, we, we will hire um, advocates and case managers um, care managers, clinicians, and other folks who will be there when, if and when um, the resident is ready to engage in services. But we're never going to force those services upon someone um, involuntarily. And we're not going to say, if you don't engage in services, you can't live here, right? So once again, it's not, it's not a um, determination, right? That people do not have to engage in services in order to keep their housing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so again, with along with you know not having preconditions right for housing, we also know that self determination right is a is a huge principle of housing first. Um, that it really is going to be um, you know driven by by the client themselves. Um, client or tenant choice is an extremely important from day one. Um, whether that is you know choosing um, what kind of furniture um, they would like or what kind of art they would like in their room, um, all the way to choosing again. Um, how they're going to inter interact with their community. And if, if they're going to want to engage with a case manager or with services, that is going to, again, be client-driven. Um, and that we want to make sure that we're always thinking about client choice and voice uh, before ever pushing anything upon someone that they're not willing, something that they are not willing to engage in. Um, harm reduction, again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and social integration and community is absolutely one of the most important principles of Housing First. Um, we typically see buildings that are maybe, you know, as small as say 10 units all the way up to uh, maybe 60 units. Um, you know, typically we don't see supportive housing in a, in a single site or, or, or um, I should say one building that has more than 60 units. That, that gets to be really hard to manage. But um, typically on reservations, we might see 30, 20 or 30 units as sort of an average size. Um, and being able to have people have the ability to integrate with their neighbors and really do community building. Um, again, whether that is, you know, being led by elders in the community, um, bringing culture and tradition into the community, um, bringing dance again, circles, and, um, you know, having, having sage burning as soon as somebody walks into the building, um, having gardens, right, again, where, where native foods can be, um, can be grown really designing a building and then uh, designing the programming and the social integration pieces through um, through a lens that is culturally relevant, responsive, and trauma-informed 
um, is really what we have seen as a, as a principle, a strong principle that makes this type of housing work and makes people feel as though one, they are home and two, that they do have a community um, of friends and, and support staff and uh, mentors, peer mentors and otherwise, um, if, if and when, again, they, they need that. But we do know that one of the reasons that this model is so successful is because of the community aspects and the community building um, that are able to go into these types of, of buildings. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, great. So again, I talked a little bit about the service approach being voluntary, right? So knowing that um, we're not going to force people into services and it's not a condition of the residency. Um, we also want to target it based on different populations, right? Whether we're, we're targeting maybe a youth population, a young people population, those services would be pretty different, right? Than if we were targeting an elderly or senior population with say veterans. Um, sometimes we've seen buildings that are serving people who have criminal justice backgrounds. Um, you know, if there are people who are serving um, domestic violence um, and sexual violence survivors, right? Those services are going to be targeted based on the population that is going to be served. And sometimes these will be mixed populations, right? This is not just to say that um, all veterans might live in a building. We've seen some, um, I want to say um, the Ho-Chunk Nation has done a veterans program, um, Crow, I want to say has done um, the Ipsalica Warrior Apartments, that's 15 units just for veterans. So there are some examples that we can look to. Um, the one that I will show you later from um, Salish and Kootenai focused on people coming out of jail. So, you know, we will see that sometimes it's easier to design programming and develop a housing program for a specific target population. Um, but again, the services are flexible and responding to comprehensive resident needs. And they are as independent as possible, right? Meaning that the focus really is on housing stability. First and foremost, our goal at the end of the day is getting people housed and then keeping people housed. Um, and again, anything beyond that is going to be client choice, right? Around whether they would like to work or volunteer in their community, um, whether they are, are interested in engaging in some sort of um, therapy or, or medication to address substance use or, or mental health challenges. Um, you know, these are all things that, again, after housing somebody stably, anything else is really, it's, it's, it's client choice, and it is, um, it's kind of a, a, an added benefit, but it is definitely not the um, primary focus. So the focus really is on housing stability. Uh, next slide, please. So some keys that we really have seen to um, services working in permanent supportive housing, um, that they are again comprehensive, that we, we spend months prior to a building opening really planning out with um, the service providers in your community, right? So, so bringing in, you know, whomever it makes sense from if you're with a tribe, for example, tribal health and the advocacy services and, you know, um, um, you know, maybe um, employment services and um, family services and children's services. And so really targeting, you know, the, the, the services that are going to be so comprehensive across the board so that we have a plan to either provide those direct services or refer them out to another department or partner if the lead service provider can't provide those things. But we want to make sure that we have everything from um, domestic violence, advocacy and response covered to, you know, um, employment job readiness and training covered. So, um, all of that to say as well is that at the, at the foundation to that, we want to make sure that these are relevant, culturally relevant and responsive services. Um, and that again, tenant driven philosophy, the focus on housing stability, that we really have effective engagement strategies, right? So we're not knocking on somebody's door and saying, hey, you know, you're, you're supposed to show up for a three o'clock meeting with your case manager, right? We, we really think about creative engagement strategies that might be more, you know, setting up a card game, um, taking a walk with somebody with their service dog, you know, if, if that's the way in which you might find somebody who's more willing to open up. Baking cookies, right? Um, and having, you know, um, available snacks, um, having tea offered and coffee in the lobby where people can come down and, and chat and having a comfortable lobby where they can sit, you know, next to the mailboxes, they come down to get their mail. Um, they can stop and, you know, have a cup of tea and just sit and, and, and chat. And I mean, that really is a form of engagement for us. You know, engagement starts with um, relationship building, right? And then anything else beyond that is, is going to be based on what, what the resident is really looking for. So it's thinking outside of the box, it's being creative, it's maybe you know um, arranging for a group to go on a fishing trip, right? It might be arranging um, for a group to go 
um, you know, again, on the waters, if that's something that you're close to, um, you know, being out in nature, um, you know, thinking about planting a, a community garden or rooftop garden, um, teaching cooking classes. I mean, it could be any of those. Um, and again, we just don't think about these services as being black and white. We really just think of them being a collaborative um, spiritual effort between the service providers and the residents who are going to engage in those. Um, there certainly needs to be appropriate staffing and supervision in place in the building. Um, and again, those partnerships and linkages with either other departments within the tribe or within other, you know, other community resources within the community to make sure that, you know, if, if we don't do legal services, for example, we make sure that we get them connected to, you know, the, the tribal public defender's office or somebody who does do legal services. Um, and so those are all just kind of coming up with a strong services plan in the beginning when you're thinking about developing housing is, is a key aspect to making sure that these work in the long run. And then we're gonna you know, focus certainly on having a very collaborative relationship with a property management company. And that might be the housing authority if you're, you know, if the tribe is, is the one developing, they might also do the property management or you know, the housing authority might say, we really don't have the capacity or the expertise in permit supportive housing and we're gonna bring in a third party property manager who can help us with that, right? Um, sometimes when you see, you know, like the tribal HUD dash program um, with, certain, with certain groups, um, you know, oftentimes those veterans are not housed in housing authority housing, but maybe out in the larger community housed with private landlords. That can get a little bit trickier just when you are working with individual landlords who may or may not kind of understand the goal of a supportive housing community. So again, that's kind of why we really push for this um, integrated single site model where we know that it's either the housing authority or a specialized group of property managers working in PSH who can really who follow the same mission and vision and um, philosophy around housing first. And even though the property manager certainly has their um, compliance um, pieces that they have to abide to and that they're obviously responsible for this asset and for managing and maintaining a building, we also wanna make sure that there's a strong understanding between the property manager and the service provider about who we are trying to house here, why we're trying to house them, and how we can be um, the most successful in really um, getting people housed and connected to services. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I think I kind of went through some of these. These are maybe some of the other, um, you know, traditional counseling services, health and mental health services, you know, alcohol substance use services. Um, again, other examples of, that we think of, we've got this picture here of um, a woman gardening. And again, that's that's one of my favorite ways of engaging people in, in, in you know, coming back to the land and, and nature and really connecting that way. Um, that goes along with the community building activities. Um, sometimes people need help with budgeting, money management, paying their rent on time, right? Following, um, following up with a lease agreement. Um, you know, if people haven't really been housed in an environment where that has been an expectation or if they've had trouble um, managing um, whatever money they might have, that might be an example of a service that could be helpful. Um, independent living skills, you know, employment skills, again, mentoring, benefits acquisition, children and family services, this all kind of falls under the core umbrella of case management, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about harm reduction. Um, what harm reduction says is that, you know, we, we know that poverty and homelessness, as well as mental health and, and drug and alcohol use and abuse have been um, part of our modern society for a very long time. Um, and that we're probably not going to um, eliminate these things. Um, but we, we, we believe with housing first and harm reduction that it's better to work with someone to minimize the harm, right? That they might be causing themselves because of alcohol abuse or um, um, mental illness rather than ignoring it or stigmatizing the condition, right? So we're trying to accept for better or for worse that licit and illicit chemical use is part of our world and we choose to minify we choose to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than simply ignore or condemn, condemn them. Uh, next slide, please. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes this is a, a, a little bit of a hard concept when, when folks um, are, are working within this concept of supportive housing and housing first. Um, you know, it, it can sound sometimes scary. And at the same time, I try to, 
I try to, you know, think about how we use harm reduction practices really in our everyday lives, right? So, so you know, as a, as a white person, I will put on sunscreen to, you know, try to try to prevent my skin from getting burned or getting skin cancer. You know, when we're riding in a car, right, we will put on seatbelts so that if we are in an accident, we hopefully are, are, are safe and they're not severely injured, right, or hurt in, in a uh, car accident. Same thing with bicycles. If you're riding a bike, right, you might want to put on a helmet, right, as, as opposed to not wearing a helmet so that if there is an accident that you try to protect your head. So a lot of these things, right? Um, nicotine patches or gum for somebody who's trying to quit smoking, blood pressure medication, cholesterol medication, right? So, you know, if I'm addicted to cheese and I really love my cheese and I don't want to give it up, you know, my doctor might say to me, well, you can either go on cholesterol medication or you can stop eating cheese. And so, you know, I mean, one way to kind of try to keep my cholesterol under control is that I may opt to take the medication, right? And, and that again is just kind of an example of harm reduction. Um, again, trying to make sure that we are minimizing the harm, right? That we're doing to ourselves and to others. Um, instead of saying, you know, you have to, you have to stop drinking, you have to stop, stop drinking. Um, if somebody is really struggling with, with chemical uh, dependency or substance use, you know, one form of harm reduction might be, you know, trying to help somebody if they are, if they are, you know, if they've been used to carrying around a pint of vodka on the streets to survive and to cope. Um, you know, one of the things that, that sometimes we try to do is help people move off of the hard alcohol, um, maybe onto beer, right? So beer, you know, goes through you pretty quickly. You have to go to the bathroom a lot. You start to get a beer belly, right? You may want to eat a lot more. And so these are all actually harm reduction techniques, right? That are trying to make sure that people are, are doing less harm if possible to themselves, right? So that's just an example of harm reduction um, that we've seen to work. Um, and uh, thank you, Wynette, for saying you absolutely love this slide. I think, I think again, it's, you know, it's, it's about, um, Kind of trying to come up with everyday right scenarios where where we do harm reduction in our everyday lives and then there, therefore it, it doesn't seem um so scary i guess when we try to work with clients who might have some addiction issues um and really saying you know what what is going to keep you safe right um even at, for for survivor right i mean how do we come up with with a safety plan right that is a form of harm reduction where we are making sure that we are trying to have a plan in place um, in, in the event that something happens, right? So, so how do we try to reduce, minimize um, the harm that could be caused by some by someone else or by some or by oneself um, by putting things into place that are really going to try to take some of that pressure off, take some of the heaviest heaviness off, and really try to keep people and their communities as safe as possible. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And again, please, if, if any of this is kind of feeling, um, some, some of you may be um, very familiar with these concepts and some of this might be new to people. So if, if any of this feels really uncomfortable or counterintuitive, um, please, you know, put that into the chat, you know, raise your hand. I, I, I'm happy to um, take feedback and, and questions and um, give examples of kind of, you know, how we, how we make sure that this really works in a way that, that it feels good for folks. Um, so again, I just opened it up to say if anybody has um, questions or thoughts about the housing first and, and harm reduction models, please don't hesitate to, to uh, put those into the chat. Um, you know, again, trauma, this is, this is something um, I think that, you know, probably everybody here on this webinar is, um, you probably work with folks every day um, who are experiencing uh, a trauma, and you know, I'm not gonna, I, I won't stand here or sit here as a, you know, as a, as a white person explaining to you um, what trauma is like. But I, I do like to bring in this slide because what we try to do is tie that into a trauma-informed care approach when doing this this kind of work. And so, um, so what we try to do is, you know, when when we're working with individuals who live in supportive housing, we can pretty much know that and expect that, you know. Uh, this is almost a universal experience, right? This slide says of people with mental and substance use disorders, I would argue that trauma has no boundaries really period, right? As, and is a uni universal experience, I think for everyone. Um, again, there's different levels and layers of trauma. There's you know, big T, little T, you know, obviously there's institutionalized and, and historical um, generational trauma, as well as the traumas that people who, um, you know, have to face racism and classism and sexism and heterosexism every single day deal with. Um, all of those are traumas, right, that, that add up. Um, and we also know that, you know, sexual violence, domestic violence brings huge trauma 
as does homelessness itself. And so what we're trying to just acknowledge is that people who live in these buildings will probably universally have trauma. And so how do we as advocates and practitioners um, approach the work that we do with people through this lens of trauma-informed care? Uh, next slide, please. So again, just kind of a, a brief look at the brain, um, you know, and again, what trauma does to the brain, right? So, so when somebody is, is in trauma, right, when somebody has been triggered, right, and, um, you know, the, the, the amygdala is firing, and we're seeing that, you know, if, if sometimes I like to talk to my, you know, 12 year old about his, his wizard brain, right, versus his lizard brain, right? So when he, when you have your, your wizard brain where you're, you're thinking rationally and, and, and you know, you're going along smoothly and all of a sudden your lid kind of pops, right? Because either something or someone has triggered you. Um, and so what, that hap what happens then is that, that that has an intense stress, right? That overwhelms the brain. It overwhelms our biological, our physiological and our social coping capacity, right? So, so it's our fight or flight response, right? And so what happens is then we start to activate our survival responses, right? So if, if a victim looks and sees somebody who either is, right, a, an abuser or, per, or perpetrator or thinks that that person is, their survival response is going to be activated, right, which means that they are going to shut down everything that is not essential. And really, it may impede rational thinking, right? So what that person is trying to do, what that, that survivor is trying to do is get away, right, from a potential threat or danger and get to a place that is going to hopefully um, allow for some safety and for allow for that nervous system, right, to start to sort of recover. But in the moment, um, we can basically see that this person's brain is literally on fire. And, you know, when somebody has been triggered um, for, for staff, again, working with somebody um, to understand what that looks like, right? So if somebody's not thinking rationally or responding rationally, um, instead of trying to have a rational discussion with that person, right? Um, what we can do through trauma-informed care lens is realize this person is triggered. So I want to try to do what I can to de-escalate the situation and put this person into a place where they will begin to feel safe. And that will look very different, right? For whomever it is that you're working with. Um, and there's not going to be one, you know, approach that for everything, but just, I think the recognition, right? So realizing what's happening, recognizing the trauma, um, and then responding appropriately, right? Is what, is what a trauma-informed care approach um, looks like. Uh, would you go on the next slide, please? So again, six principles, according to SAMHSA, of what this trauma-informed approach um, looks like. So again, first and for, foremost, safety, right? When somebody is, is, has been traumatized, is triggered, or is in a state of trauma, um, we want to consider safety, right? We want to figure out where and how can we try to um, get this person to a safe place or um, really get rid of any unsafe environments or, or elements um, in the environment that might um, um, cause that person to feel worse in their trauma. Um, trustworthiness and transparency is also something where, you know, somebody who has been traumatized, um, building that rapport, building that relationship. And again, it might start with sitting down with somebody over a cup of coffee or a, a cup of tea um, and really trying to build that trustworthiness. Peer support, um, you know, finding people who have lived or similar experiences um, and bringing those people in to support uh, folks who will be living in your supportive housing building is, is really important. Finding people who um, have have lived experience and, and can really help um, because they've they've experienced it they've been there and they can really work with people who might be might be struggling um, collaboration and mutuality is also a, a principle empowerment again voice and choice and everything that we do hearing the the residents voice and choice um, doing what what we can to to allow for them to be empowered themselves um, and also just being very aware of these cultural historical and gender issues um, so those are kind of again from SAMHSA substance abuse and mental health administration um, six principles of a trauma-informed approach uh, next slide and again just um among those, those, you know, that ability to realize and respond appropriately, um, you know, if somebody comes in after having a really bad day, and again, has maybe been, been recently triggered, and they come in and they yell at a bunch of front desk staff, right, 
um, you know, our response as staff is not to, you know, yell back at that person or ask, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you acting like this? Why are you always, you know, arguing with me or, you know, saying these mean things or doing this to your neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, usually understanding that there is something deeper, much deeper that's happening and really trying to get at the cause, right, of instead of why are you doing this, you know, trying to start asking those questions of what happened to you in the past to cause you to react this way, right? So what is, what is the trigger? Um, is it a sense? Is it a smell? Is it something you saw, you know, when you were either out on the street or as you walked into this building? Um, really trying to figure out, you know, again, through those relationships, what happened to you? Um, so that we can start to address those past experiences as opposed to just thinking that somebody is doing this because they're angry and that they're going to change. Um, and again, that is that takes very skilled um, practitioners and advocates and people who are in this space every day to really um, work with folks to understand a bit about their past and their history, um, to have a basic understanding, a better understanding of, of what's happening right now in the moment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just one building um, as well I wanted to show. This was um, on the Macaw Reservation in Nia Bay, Washington. Um, a couple of um, pictures here that you can see of a permanent supportive housing building um, that is beautifully designed and built um, and is serving uh, tribal members who were uh, formerly homeless. I can move on to the next slide as well. Um, so this is called the Sail River Longhouse, um, and again, as you can kind of see in this picture on the left, um, there's a very safe and secure front door entrance that people go into and through. Um, and this is a best, you know, this is really something that we've seen as, as working very well, something that we try to follow in the design of these buildings, is, it, is that there is this one in and out door. Um, obviously, there's other doors in the building, but there's a, there's kind of a secure front door entrance and exit with staff right at a, at a lobby area that are really able to keep um, eyes and ears on the building and who's coming and going. This is this is really more for as much for the safety, right, more for the safety of the residents who live there um, and making sure that they have a safe home, right, that they can come home to. And that if there are people who should not be in that building, um, if there are people who who a resident is trying to avoid. Um, because that person might be putting them in an unsafe situation. Um, we have staff on site 24 seven to make sure that only residents and approved guests and visitors um, are allowed into the building. So in this case, you can see that folks walk through that front door into a lobby um, that has this nice fireplace with open space for sitting, um, standing. There's also services offices. Um, and then to the right, and I'll show you a better picture here, I think in a minute, that you then can enter into a secure courtyard. So you can see that there's an entrance into individual balcony, or excuse me, individual apartments from this courtyard, and then there's also balconies. So um, if you go on to the next slide, you can see that this creates an incredible, um, sorry, oh, this just give you a little a shot at um, the other, a couple of the other buildings from the outside. Um, and again, um, many of the folks who lived here, live here, have disabilities and, and, and would not otherwise be able to maintain housing without the services that are provided. But um, the next slide should show the courtyard scene, um, which is one of my favorites. And so you can just kind of see how this is a beautifully designed circular courtyard space um, where, you know, people have access again to their own apartments um, from the inside of this courtyard. And then, you know, families can kind of watch what's going on from their balcony. So if their kids are playing down in the courtyard, or in this case, if there's a ceremony or dance happening, you know, folks can watch that. And so you've got the fire, um, other elements that um, the Macaw tribe de decided to bring in here, and just really being able to do this through an incredibly, you know, culturally um, relevant, as well as safe, um, design that allows for people to have access, um, but at the same time know that there aren't going to be people who are getting into that courtyard or into their apartments until they've gone through um, a secure front door. All right, uh, next slide, please. And these are just a couple other examples. Um, I would say Zoe, my, my business partner um, and colleague, has really worked on all of these um, PSH projects in Indian country. So, um, you know, she is originally from um, 
from Minnesota and had done some projects with Fond du Lac, um, White Earth um, up in Bemidji with partnership with Leech Lake and Red Lake. Gamaji, as I mentioned, the 29 units of supportive housing is in Duluth, and that's more of an urban Indian center, but serves tribes from Northern Minnesota. Um, I think I mentioned Ho-Chunk with 15 units for veterans, the Ute Mountain Ute in, um, in Toyak in Colorado. Um, so a number of examples of where this type of housing has really worked and worked well um, in, in, in Indian country. So lots of examples. This is, um, this is a, a kind of a condensed list, but certainly I would um, encourage you to reach out to, to Zoe or to any of these partners listed here if you have additional questions about their buildings um, and how they went about developing them. All right, next slide. Okay, so I, I now I'm going to kind of shift into the part around development. Um, I just wanted to see if there was any any questions or um, comments that people had sort of about, about the model itself before I kind of get into the development process. We like to, to frame it so that um, there's an understanding right of what what model um, we're talking about when we talk about developing supportive housing, um, but just want to make sure that um, if anybody has a question before we move on, then I'm able to uh, to address those. And thank you, Wynette, for chatting into the box that she'll be sending a follow up email with a PDF of these slides and a recording to the webinar. So we'll just kind of talk briefly about the development process in supportive housing. Um, kind of a timeline, who's part of that team, finding those right partners, um, sort of, you know, what we call alphabet soup with all these different acronyms when we talk about financing. Um, and then I will end with a case study again with the um, CSKT. So next slide, please. So what I will say just in general is that um, the development process uh, takes a long time. <laughs> um, it's a pretty complex process that involves a lot of multiple partners across disciplines. So, you know, thinking about if you're, if you're, you know, tribe or your council decides that this is something that they might want to do, again, it's probably going to take, you know, your housing authority, TDHE, it's going to take your advocacy services, it's going to take infrastructure and technology and your um, planning department, and it's going to take you know, behavioral health and maybe employment or HR, a whole lot of different partners to make sure that we are considering everything that needs to um, be taken into consideration for building um, a project. We're working with Muckleshoot Tribe right now up in Washington, and, you know, they're trying to identify land to build about 50 units of supportive housing and looking at, you know, an acre that is on reservation and an acre that's off reservation and trying to figure out <laughs> if they can develop on both and what that means. Right, so really, you know, bringing in, you know, your 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 council and obviously getting um, feedback if you are working within a tribe to try to do something like this, and then really figuring out who are the partners that are going to be need, need to be involved. Um, when we're thinking about development, we think about three budgets, right? We think about the budget that you're going to need to actually build a building, and so your 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 bricks and mortar, right? Your capital that you're going to need to develop a building. You will need to think about an operating budget. Because as we know, again, we've said all of these folks are going to be low income. And so we know that people will not be able to pay what, for example, fair market rent would be. And so we know that we're going to have to have some sort of an operating subsidy, usually that comes in the form of a voucher. And this might be a VASH voucher, for example, for veterans. It might be a um, project-based voucher uh, or tenant-based rental assistance that your housing authority provides. Um, but we will need to put together an operations budget to make sure that we can keep the lights on and pay the rent. Um, and then the third budget is a services budget. So ensuring that again, we have that 24 hour staff that we've got the right, um, you know, uh, advocates and peer mentors and navigators and care managers in the building, um, we will need to put together a supportive services budget as well. And all that is to say that funding sources are very complicated <laughs> and that we're probably looking at, you know, anywhere from a two to four year period. So from initial envisioning what your project concept might be all the way through to, um, you know, your feasibility stage and, you know, your, your financing stage and your construction stage and your lease up stage. Um, we really are probably looking at, you know, anywhere on a fast, very fast track, two years to four years. Uh, next slide. So again, um, there may not be a lot of standard terminology or, or model, right? So what, what, you know, one person might refer to as a Section 8 voucher, or somebody else might refer to as TBRA. Um, you know, when we're looking at different, you know, funding sources, 
you know, we might have, you know, Indian Housing Block Grant versus ARPA, you know, so there's a lot of different things that people are going to be talking about. Um, it's, it's very complicated in terms of when we say LIHTC, which is low income housing tax credits, that's the primary funding source that a lot of these buildings use to get um, that equity to build. And so um, there may be different languages that investors speaking versus your developer versus your service provider. But with all that said, tasks are very interdependent. There's multiple players and having um, a team that can work together, knowing that timing and around deadlines, funding applications, et cetera, is critical, is really important. Uh, next slide. So the five phases of development, again, um, kind of broadly speaking, you've got your, your concept, you know, who are we going to serve? What are we going to do? You know, we're, we're looking at serving, you know, um, 50 tribal members from Muckleshoot who, um, you know, both families and individuals, right? Maybe uh, 22 bedrooms, you know, um, 21 bedrooms and 10 three bedrooms. So really kind of coming up with a concept. Um, is it feasible, right? So is the land that we're looking at building on, is it trust land, right? Is, is, does it have infrastructure, right? Um, you know, can we actually defend the need for this many people going into these units? You go through that whole sort of due diligence phase of feasibility. Um, and then the deal making is really kind of your financing phase, right? So you might be applying for tax credits, you might be applying for vouchers, you might be applying for um, grant funding from your healthcare foundation or from um, HUD or from, you know, other sources. Um, you know, is it going to be feasible in terms of funding your services? And will you have all the right providers to the table? So those are really big, big phases that probably take a year or two be, before you even hit the construction period, right? Construction typically takes about 12 to 14 months, I would say. And then operations is once you, you know, lease your residence up, um, move people in, and then start operating the building on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, um, I could go into a lot more detail on each of these, but I just wanted to kind of give a broad overview of what sort of our, our big five phases of development are to initially start. Uh, next slide, please. So again, bringing three di very different disciplines together, development, support services, and property management, you need all three, right? In typical traditional affordable housing, um, we might just see the development and property management, but with supportive housing, you have to have that third arm or that third leg of the stool for it to really, really work. And then I would also add a fourth one being the design piece, because I think that is just as critical when we're thinking about trauma-informed design and culturally relevant design. You know, your architect and whomever is going to be putting together those, those design features, amenity spaces, gardens, rooftop gardens, you know, water features, et cetera. Your, your design people and your architects really need to be a part of um, the development team as well. Uh, next slide. Um, and then just brief, you know, kind of um, roles, responsibilities. So you're gonna have an owner and a sponsor. Usually that would be, um, you know, it, it, again, it would be a tribe. Um, it might be the TDHE, um, or you might have an outside, um, you know, independent organization that is going to be legally responsible for the project, the driving force behind the project. You will bring in a developer, and again, that might be your housing authority or it might be an outside developer. Um, they are responsible for really delivering a complete functional project. Um, that architect as well as part of the development team, they're brought in to design the project. A property manager is brought on to do the real estate management and operate the building. And then your service provider is there to design and implement um, services supportive services plan with an appropriate staffing plan and making sure that you have all the right services that either can be provided on site or that can be referred off site to your residents. Next slide, please. And again, when we talk about some of the funding sources, the big ones that we think about, um, again, just if I throw out these acronyms, I want to make sure you know what they are, IHPG, Indian Housing Block Grant, um, ICDBG, um, Indian Community Development uh, Block Grant, the Federal Home Loan Bank is the FHLB, and Low Income Housing Tax Credits um, is what we usually um, refer to as LIHTC. Okay, next slide, please. I do want to talk a little bit about this new money, if, if you will, the stimulus money um, that actually has, has been out now for a couple of months, although we're still really waiting to hear from HUD about guidelines for how the American Tribal Recovery Act funding for tribes is going to work. Um, I think actually tr some tribes are very much further ahead um, than I would say non-tribal entities on, on getting some of their guidance um, and have always already started using some of this funding. So uh, next slide. Um, 
you know, so, so Treasury, I will say, last year offered through the CARES Act um, money that went directly to tribes. This year, again, Treasury funds through the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, is offering $20 billion directly to tribes, which was more than twice as much as last year. Um, basically, tribes can use this money. Um, they can transfer the funds to nonprofits and or tribal organizations. Um, and they've got a deadline within the next, really now, three and a half, four years, three and a half, really, um, the deadline for tribes to spend funds and use the funds, um, recipients can use can only use funds for costs incurred by December 31st of 2024. Um, and again, these, these are really, all of these costs have to be associated back to COVID, right, to respond to the public health emergency with respect to the coronavirus. So um, we can really make that case very easily with supportive housing because we know that um, people who are facing domestic violence situations, people who are um, homeless, people who are incarcerated and can't be released because they have no home to go home to are all at very high risk of contracting coronavirus. So really, we've been able to make this case quite easily um, that this is all COVID related, being able to give people safe and sanitary conditions to live in um, and be able to socially distance, distance as well as do other things that are um, recommend, recommended in CDC guidelines. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, just as it relates to the supportive services programs and housing assistance, specifically for Native Americans, um, section 11003, again, you can, if you can look this up, we can send these slides out. Um, I am not an, a, a HUD expert by any means um, or a Treasury Act expert, but I did just wanna point out, I guess, the main point of this slide is just to say there is a lot of money available, 750 million specifically until September 30th of 2025, right? And this is this is for tribes specifically. Um, and again, this is under NAHASDA. Um, of that money, 450 million is IHBG, 5 million is for Native Hawaiian block grants, 280 million for Indian Community Development block grants. Um, and again, coming in through HUD, um, generally going to tribes and TDAG specifically, um, and really just looking to have tribes um, allocate these funds to spend in a way that we've not had the opportunity to, to spend before on housing and supportive services. Uh, next slide. Um, again, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs specifically, um, we know that there is 900 million, um, which goes specifically broken down as 100 million for tribal housing improvements. 772.5 million for tribal government services, public safety and justice, social services, child welfare, and other related expenses. Again, we're seeing, we're working with Turtle Mountain, for example, on a program that they wanna do for, um, for foster care children or people who have, children who have been separated from their families or, and are um, as a part of um, uh, the child welfare program. We're trying to help them figure out how to maybe spend some of these funds um, for child welfare assistance. So looking at, you know, a similar type of supportive services program, but specifically for um, kids who have been separated from their families um, and are really in need of some sort of safe, supportive environment to then hopefully be reconnected back to, to their families. Um, next slide, please. Okay, great. So yeah, I did just want to highlight um, a really, I think, very important um, and impressive project that literally got put together in about four months last year in 2020. <laughs> so um, again, this was using CARES Act funding, which at the time we thought we only had until December 30th of 2020 to spend. Um, Congress then ended up extending that deadline for a year, but in late de December. So by that point, we really had almost spent down a lot of these funds. But all this is to say that this is a model that I believe can be transferred into using some of the new tribal um, ARPA funds, and just wanted to kind of show and highlight some of the things that um, the Confederate Sal Salish and Kootenai tribes did. So this is a supportive housing community called the Morning Star Apartments. Um, it is owned by the tribe. And then you can either go to the next slide or there might be another bullet point on this one. Uh, great, thank you. So essentially last year, uh, the tribe received about $7.5 million um, in CARES Act funding. And they really decided they wanted to put almost all of that towards housing. Um, they did some modulars, they bought some manufactured modular homes for families, and then they did spend almost $2 million, about $1.8 million on this project. So they acquired an old motel on the Flathead Indian Reservation, um, and they did a pretty substantial rehab of it. 
Um, it was a 16 unit motel. What they decided to do is turn it into 14 units of permanent supportive housing. There's also one caretaker unit, which um, is occupied by somebody who lives there overnight. Um, and then there's one unit that was converted into a services staff office. Um, there's a small service space for you know doing property management, lease up work, telemental health, probation hearings, um, et cetera. And then there's also a shared laundry room. Again, the focus was on people who were homeless um, and were leaving incarceration or waiting to be released from jail and were at very high risk of, of, of COVID. Um, the services on staff um, include um, you know, referrals to behavioral health offsite, employment and other services that the tribe provides. Um, but I will say that the tribal public defender's office has been the lead service provider on this project and they have been amazing. Um, so between them hiring this full-time care manager who serves as a coordinator, as well as the overnight caretaker, um, and then really their public defender staff who helps with legal issues, court hearings, et cetera, um, they have been dealing, they've been doing this from the beginning when they said, we will take on the role as long as we know we have other departments that we can refer out to. Um, and then the housing authority, I want to give a huge shout out to them as well. They provided project-based Section 8 vouchers so that the units are subsidized. Um, and again, it's that model of no one paying more than 30% of their income towards rent, but um, the subsidy, the voucher subsidizes and pays up to market rate, uh, for fair market rent, excuse me, for, um, for each individual unit. And these are individual um, units that have really they're more studios. So you have a, a, a bedroom that you a kind of living space and bedroom you walk into. There's a small kitchenette with a um, separate sink and then their own bathroom. Um, and again, this is a you know a model that is non-time limited. People can stay there for as long as they need to. Um, and services are being provided using the housing first uh, trauma-informed care and harm reduction models. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit about who was on this project team. So again, the voucher administrator is SKH or the Salish and Kootenai Housing Authority. The lead service provider um, is the CSKT tri Tribal Public Defender's Office. Um, the owner and developer is the tribe itself, right? So they, they do own the property. Um, they used an outside contractor um, and development consultant, RT Hawk, to help them with the actual financing and, and developing of the project. And then they use local contractors for the rehab. And then the property manager is an outside local company. So, so the housing authority said, we don't want it. We're providing the operating subsidy. We can't do the property management. So they um, partnered with a company in Polson called Be Smart. And that, that property management company is working out really well for the Morningstar permits. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, just consultants and other contractors they brought in, RT Hawk um, as a consultant, they brought in Bo Simone, myself and Zoe um, to help on the supportive housing front. Jacola Engineering and Architecture did all the architect, architect and engineering work and then r, r Building Productions did the actual rehab as the contractor. Uh, next slide. So just a couple of pictures of before and after. Um, as you can see, it was, you know, um, you know, freestanding motel, but not in the best shape and really had not had a lot of work done on it. Um, they went in, they um, redid all of the rooms. So ripped up old carpet and laid flooring, um, new paint jobs. Um, you know, that's the staffing office that you see up on the upper right. Um, but we, you know, we brought in, you know, very sustainable and durable furniture, furnished all of the apartments. Um, put up a fence around the outside so that we really are trying to have kind of a one what one way in one day out one way out even though people have individual access to their rooms from the outside um, the service office is positioned in a way that they can actually see all um, 14 units kind of put into the middle there are cameras as well on the outside of the building just so that um, you know we're able to see who is who's um, in you know coming into the fence and, and maybe on the perimeter um, and again there is staff between the caretaker who lives on site and the coordinator um, who's there full time, as well as a, a space for the leasing agent property management. So it really is a process um, and a project that is covered um, 24 hours a day. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, they did this for $1.8 million, which included the acquisition, the rehab, appraisals, inspections, environmentals, architect engineering fees, IT, the furnishings and supplies, and the housing um, and supportive housing consultants. And again, this was all CARES Act money. Um, but again, the point to be able to say this is really a model, um, I believe, in Indian country that can be very easily replicated, and even in, in non-Native communities, to be able to use some of this ARPA fund funding that is coming in, um, both going to tribes directly 
directly as well as to um, states and cities and governments directly um, to really put forward right transformative housing models which we believe this is um, that can really make a huge impact um, so 14 people right salish and kootenai tribal members are no longer homeless no longer sitting in jail cells waiting to be released and are living in their own homes with supportive services uh, next slide please and then just a lot of things that we did to make sure that this was going to be a sustainable project um, there were a lot of mous that were put in place between the tribe um, outlining you know what's the what the tribe is responsible for what the defender's office was responsible for we came up with a resident or tenant selection plan which really outlines the eligibility criteria based on income tribal membership um, and then you know people who are at risk of of of, of of contracting COVID, that was really the priority area. Um, put together a services plan, the operating and supportive services budgets. Um, again, there was a an MOU put in place between the tribe and the housing authority. Um, the housing authority provided the application. Um, we looked at a vulnerability index to help with prioritizing people with the highest need. Um, and then, you know, worked with the property manager to come up with the lease agreement, the pet agreement, fair housing verification, et cetera, and then help them to create some of these position descriptions for the jobs, both for the services coordinator and the caretaker. Uh, next slide. And then a larger task force with CSKT has also been put into place. Um, they now are looking at doing um, the next project. So um, while this really focuses on individuals, um, they are meeting um, pretty regularly to both kind of look at how this first permit sort of housing project on, um, on the reservation is working and to also just make sure that um, all of these people, right? It's, I think it, 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 it talks about how, in, how critical it is to bring all the right players to the table. Um, and so, you know, you had two former, you know, housing authority directors who were involved early on um, with this task force, you know, you've got supportive council members who are pushing this forward, you know, successful, um, you know, public defenders offices, as well as other human resource development, um, economic development and tribal health. And then again, you know, tribal lands was involved, IT was involved, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, so couldn't have done this right without having this entire group's effort um, behind making sure that this first project took place and that they're again already looking to do a, a new a new family one um, that that would be a, a different scale um, and also really target a different family population. Uh, next slide. And there's the staff, the amazing folks who made this happen. Um, so you've got Jody Perez on the end there at the right. She's the housing authority director. Um, Ann Miller, who's the lead uh, managing attorney from the tribal defender's office. Um, Janet Campbell, who helped with a lot of the finances and legal pieces. And Suzette on the left there, another staff member from, um, from the tribal defender's office. So you can see them there just kind of posing under the new, the new sign for the Morning Star Apartments. Um, they took the, the original name of the motel was Starlight. And... Um, uh, in honor of actually somebody who had passed away in their community, um, whose whose nickname, um, one of their names that they went by was was Morning Star, um, passed away from COVID, and so they really wanted to name these these apartments in honor um, of that person and 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 really tell that story about what the why this came about, the how it came about, and and how important it is um, that we're now. Um, that they're now able to say we're, we're trying to offer um, a safe and supportive place for people to live so that they don't continue to lose more, more of their uh, families, relatives, and members to, to the coronavirus. Uh, next slide. Um, so again, just I, I think these are my last few slides. Um, again, just um, this, is, this was kind of part one um, looking at holistic housing development and just trying to give you sort of a big picture. Um, I, I, I won't have time to kind of get into some of the operating subsidies, but at least wanted to throw them up here on the slide to let you know that there are additional ways, right, to go about trying to find these housing subsidies. Um, so, you know, project-based vouchers, as we said, is, is the best type of subsidy that can go into these buildings because they're they're long term, they stay with the unit. So it's different from a tenant based voucher where somebody who might qualify for a voucher can go to different places and utilize that voucher based on where they might accept it. With a, with a project based voucher, it stays with the unit. So even if somebody leaves, 
say the Morningstar apartment, we're going to keep that voucher and the next person, right, who comes in, it's going to help to subsidize their rent. Um, there's also HUD continuum of care PSH vouchers, which, which tribes are now eligible for COC or continuum of care dollars. They've never been so prior to this year. So um, that is also, while it is a renewal annual application, I will say that that is also a source that I would encourage folks to look to. Um, there's obviously IHBG through NAHASDA as a project-based voucher or operating subsidy. There's housing trust funds usually that come in through individual states. And then there is the tribal HUD BASH program. So again, um, it is specific for veterans. <clears throat> and so it's, it's working with the VA to um, help provide sort of the initial um, you know, eligibility for veterans experiencing homelessness and need of supportive housing. And then working with a TDAG or housing authority, they collaborate um, with the housing authority doing a lot of the um, admissions, occupancy and placements, and the VA providing the services for those veterans. Uh, next slide. And then again, just leveraging more resources for housing projects. So in addition, um, you know, we talked about, uh, I mentioned the big one, low income housing tax credits. Um, you know, that's the, again, major funding source for these low income housing projects, but leveraging Indian housing block grant and Indian community development block grant. Um, the affordable housing program is, is through that federal home loan bank program I mentioned earlier. Home dollars, again, so a lot of these CARES Act fund, funding dollars, excuse me, Treasury Act funding dollars that are coming in have an allocation specifically through home. And those are HUD dollars that are specifically being allocated for housing and homelessness. <clears throat> housing trust funds, and then um, Title VI, which is more of a loan program, <coughs> but something certainly that, um, that tribes can consider as well in terms of leveraging resources. Okay, next slide. I think I'm almost done. Um, just COVID-related funding opportunities. Again, checking out ARPA, working with your tribe or um, local, you know, local governments as well to find out how they're planning on allocating those ARPA dollars. Um, and then again, emergency rental assistance and these emergency rental vouchers that we're seeing coming in as well as part of ARPA. So what we're saying as well is that tribes are eligible to apply for vouchers that are not through their own housing authority, but that are through a local public housing authority. Um, and so in really seeing, right, either through the COC, um, you know, homeowners assistance funds, house, homeless assistance and supportive services programs, um, there are a lot of funding opportunities out there right now to help develop some of these housing programs. So I would just say, take advantage of, of trying to find out where in your own specific community, who's um, getting those ARPA funds and how they're being allocated and really making a strong case um, that some of these funds should be used for um, survivor housing, supportive housing, and um, you know, addressing homelessness as it relates to COVID uh, in your community. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, that was it. I know that was a lot that I just went through in almost an hour and 15 minutes. So hope that folks are still with us and with me. Um, and I wanna see if people have questions. Um, I know that we've got uh, at least about another 15 more minutes. This is Zoe's um, contact information. Again, I thought Zoe would be the one running this webinar today. Um, she unfortunately was not able to be here, but um, that's her contact information. My contact information is really just katie at bosimone.com. So um, you can feel free to shoot either of us an email. Um, I know Hanobi and Wynette have our contact information through Redwind, Redwind as well. I do just want to say again, thank you so much to Redwind for allowing me to do this webinar. Um, and then just want to see if anybody has any outstanding questions or comments. Um, thank you so much for why not for putting my email address in there, Katie at Bosamone.com. Um, and um, I'll put in our website as well, just if you're able to, um, if you want to look on there at some of the other projects that we've done, um, feel free to do that. And um, I'll see if folks have questions or comments and then see if um, Hanovi or why not have any comments. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, you can put them into the chat box, you can put them into the Q&A, or you can click the little hand icon. Okay, so... I see a question coming in that asks, what would be the best route to start from square one with a tribe who has very little support in the recovery community? Okay, um, so, so very little support in the recovery community. So 
I would, I, I, I think I understand the question. Um, you know, I would say probably one of the, one of the things that we like to do first is, you know, either through Redwind or through ourselves um, specifically, um, we'd love to have an initial conversation about what it is that you think you, your community and your tribe would benefit from the most. Um, there are some, some TA dollars, I will say, that are available, some technical assistance dollars that are available um, through HUD for tribes specifically to bring in either um, development consultants or supportive housing consultants to help you think through this type of project. Um, and National American Indian Housing Council um, is kind of the pass through um, for those HUD funds. So you would put a request into your local ONAP office with HUD. So you'd go through the Office of Native American Programs, put in a technical assistance request, it would go to NAIHC, and then they would assign it to a TA provider. Um, usually that I would say is a good place to start. Um, we also like to do initial conversations or presentations to tribal council, um, just again, to kind of let them know what some different housing opportunities are along the housing continuum. And then really, you know, where the funding sources come from and what's feasible. Um, so I don't know if that kind of answered your question, but are you looking specifically to do work um, within a recovery community, recovery housing community, or do you think that supportive housing might be a model that your tribe would be interested in exploring? I'll just again write into the chat box um, by going through again ONAP um, to request TA and then it goes to NAIHC. Uh, and that is a way that a lot of tribes start the process since they may not have um, the resources to bring somebody in. You can again put in this technical assistance request and then um, you know, usually, I mean, HUD right now, ONAP is unfortunately not allowing travel um, to do on-site trainings. There's still a travel ban in place, um, but that is coming from Indian Health Services. Our hope is that it will be lifted soon. But in the meantime, you know, all of that technical assistance that is being offered is being done virtually. So it's not ideal, but it is something, and that is a request that usually goes through pretty quickly through ONAP um, and then gets assigned to a TA provider. Great. And so then I see um, build housing, holistic housing, outpatient and housing all in one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say there's some really amazing models as well that we've seen. Um, I know that in Salt Lake City, for example, um, the housing authority there partnered with the Goshu tribes. Um, Goshu, um, the Goshu tribes own and operate um, clinics that are called uh, Sacred Circle. Um, this is an amazing model as well to be able to see how that holistic um, healthcare is in line with the housing. They, so the housing authority developed 100 units of supportive housing in Salt Lake City, and the Goshu tribe operates the Sacred Circle Clinic on the ground floor. So the clinic is, um, it, it, it is outpatient. They offer um, a very wide array of um, medical health and, and mental health as well as physical health, dental, um, eye care services. They have other clinics that are located around town, but this clinic specifically serves um, all of the clients who live at this building. It's called Pamela's Place, as well as anybody who walks in off the street who is Medicaid eligible. So that's a really amazing model too that I would um, recommend um, checking out. It's called Pamela's Place. And again, it's Sacred Circle Clinic um, that has figured out a, a really amazing way to do holistic healthcare. Um, and partnering with the housing authority to do it within their housing development. Thank you so much, YNEP, for the kind words. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar. And again, please feel free to reach out with other questions, um, you know, um, other examples that we can share with you of things that you are, are, are looking for. I, I mentioned Turtle Mountain as well earlier. While we're focusing more on trying to help them with a, a, a foster care sort of safe haven for children, they are also looking at doing a recovery community or recovery center 
um, at Turtle Mountain. And so that might be another, um, another tribe to reach out to um, both between the housing authority there and their office of strategic development or community development, I think it is. Um, they've been working with, um, gosh, they've been working with different partners for a couple of years to create a recovered community on, and kind of make it a campus on their reservation. So that might be as well, Turtle Mountain um, might be a great um, resource as well to reach out to about what they're doing with their recovery center. Right, any other questions or comments from folks? Sure, my email is katie at bosimone.com. Simon's. Yeah, please do. Please feel, re feel free to reach out to me. Um, would love to hear from you and uh, learn more about what, what you all are doing and hoping to do and see if Zoe and I can be of assistance uh, in any way that we can be. All right, well, I wanna say thank you again to Wynette and Hanovi and Redwind for having me. Um, thank you again for everybody who participated. I hope the last hour and a half was helpful um, and informative. Um, we'll be doing part two um, of this webinar, focusing on holistic housing, um, as well as partnerships and opportunities for advocates to uh, work with housing uh, authorities and housing developers in September. So I know that um, hopefully um, Wynette, uh, as a follow-up, can get you information to that webinar that will be taking place in September. Um, can't remember the specific date, why not, but I'm sure um, you can get that out to this group. Thank you, Katie. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Shinobi, and everybody else who, who attended today. Uh, before we end this session, or before we end the session, I want to let you all know that there will be an eval popping up once Zoom closes. We'd love to hear what you thought. So if you're able to fill that out, we'd very much appreciate it. In closing, I'd like to thank our presenter, Katie. I'd like to thank our captioner, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope you all stay safe, and I hope to see you all at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.